Hello everyone. Let's talk about hydrological cycle. When we see a figure here, it appears water is everywhere and the earth is made up of water. In reality, water covers only about a fraction of volume of earth. It is true that the surface is mostly covered with water. Actually, 71% of surface is covered with water. And this gives us a false impression that earth is mostly made up of water. Now let's compare the uh, volumes. So volume of earth is about 1 trillion cubic kilometer, whereas the volume of water is 1.4 cubic, uh, 1.4 billion cubic kilometer. Now let's see the same thing from a different perspective. A big sphere here represents planet Earth, and the small blue marble here represents the total water on Earth. Now, all water on, in, and above the Earth's surface. Okay, and out of this total water, fresh water is only 2.5 percent, and most of the fresh water is in the form of groundwater and uh, polar ice and snow. So these two represents more than 98% of fresh water. So polar ice and groundwater represents 98% of the fresh water. And this uh, smaller marble here represents um, the liquid fresh water. Okay. The smallest sphere here, you can see very tiny small um, sphere here. This represents fresh water in lakes and river. So this is the water that support most of the land animals, including humans and other aquatic animals and plants that need fresh water to survive. So in, in conclusion, we can say that the quantity of water is not as vast as it appears. The amount of fresh water is small and water in lakes and rivers, which is most easily accessible and most important for life on earth is limited so sustainable water use is vital for the long-term environment human health and economic development now let's talk a little bit more about the hydrological cycle the global hydrological cycle is a process through which water circulates between earth's atmosphere ocean and land surfaces. The cycle involves water movements in the form of precipitation, evaporation, and runoff. Precipitation is the process by which water is released from atmosphere, which can be rainfall, snow, and hail, right? And evapotranspiration is the process through which water is returned to atmosphere through evaporation from the land surface and transpiration through the plants. Now let's divide the components of hydrological cycle in, into flux and storage. So what is flux? Flux means the continuous flow, whereas storage means uh, water, amount of water stored at one particular location. So precipitation is flux because it is the flow. Similarly, um, evapotranspiration is also flux, uh, but water quantity at one time uh, in the form of water vapor at atmosphere or uh, in ocean is storage. The total annual precipitation and evapotranspiration over land and ocean are estimated to be around 111 okay so total annual precipitation is 111 uh, so the dollar value is given here is in terms of a thousand kilometer cube okay so 111 thousand kilometer cube of precipitation and out of that snowfall is 12.5 and rainfall is 98.5.
So precipitation is the sole source of water on land surface. Okay, so where do we get water on the land surface? It is the precipitation only. Precipitation also occurs on the ocean, over the ocean, and that quantity is 391. So you can clearly see the difference. Over the ocean, we get 391,000 kilometer cube of water uh, from, the rain, uh, from the atmosphere in the form of precipitation whereas land receives only 111. Now, how this uh, 111 comes from? Because it has to come from evapotranspiration, right? So evaporation from land and evaporation from ocean. So the precipitation over the ocean amounts 391, whereas the evapotranspiration is uh, 436 right so that means 45.5 uh, uh, remains that moves to the land so land receives 45.5 thousand kilometer cube of water every year um, in in the form of precipitation through ocean and the remaining has to be from the land itself so the total precipitation that falls on the land mass is 111, which is contributed by 65.5 from the evapotranspiration from the land mass and 45.5 from the water that evaporates from the ocean. So what does this show is that uh, the almost half of the water is recycled within the land mass, right? And at the given time, the water volume in ocean is uh, 1.34 trillion kilometer cube and uh, water holds 2000 kilometer cube of water and um, similarly these uh, figures here inside this rectangle this represents the storage of water so water vapor over sea is 10,000 kilometer cube water vapor over land is 3000 similarly the quantity in lake soil moisture groundwater these are the storage at any given time now river discharge is one of the most important aspect of the hydrological cycle from the water resources point of view it is the volume of water that flows through the river, uh, any river channel and eventually moves to the ocean right Direct groundwater discharge, which is about 10% of the total discharge, is also included in this river discharge. Okay, so where the water, uh, river receives water, obviously from the runoff at the time of rainfall and through the groundwater flow as well. Now, when we talk about the hydrological cycle, it involves both natural and anthropogenic cycles. So what does that mean? The natural cycle is how water is naturally cycled through the earth, atmosphere, ocean, and land mass driven by the energy of uh, sun. The anthropogenic cycle uh, involves the impact of human activities on hydrological cycles. So for example, if you build dams, if we build irrigation systems, or if you build some other water management structures, it will impact the hydrological cycle. It will impact the uh, potential evaporation. Uh, it will impact the potential runoff and a groundwater um, infiltration as well. So the hydrological cycle is a complex and interconnected system. And uh, as we know, it is critical in sustaining life on Earth. And so understanding the various components of this system and their interaction is essential for managing water resources and mitigating the impact of climate change. Let's talk about components of hydrological cycle, flux and storage parts. First, precipitation. Precipitation is a vital component of hydrological cycle. It is responsible for continuous movement and distribution of water in Earth's ecosystem. 
and it refers to the process by which atmospheric water vapor condenses and falls to the earth's surface in the form of snow, rain, sleet, hail, and any other forms of moisture. So precipitation is affected by uh, some factors such as atmospheric pressure, temperature, humidity, wind patterns. And precipitation is highly variable in space and time. So that means uh, the precipitation, amount of precipitation at uh, different places are always different. Right? So uh, in some places we get uh, more than 1500 millimeter of rainfall in one year. And in some places, um, maybe less than 100, right? So there are, uh, and there are places where you get more than 3000 millimeter of rainfall in one year as well. So there is a variation in space and there is also variation in time. So in one particular location, the amount of rainfall you receive is always different. In some in months, you get more rainfall than others. Now, accurate measurement and prediction of precipitation is very critical. Okay, so the measurement and prediction of the precipitation, they are the very critical for water resource management. And there are different techniques available uh, to measure the rainfall, like uh, radar and remote sensing. There are um, rainfall stations as well um, to measure the amount of precipitation. Next is the evaporation. Evaporation is the process of transformation of liquid water into vapor. Okay, so uh, precipitation is from vapor to liquid form or solid form that comes from atmosphere to uh, the earth surface, whereas vapor, yes, sorry, evaporation is the opposite one. So it is the transformation of liquid water into water vapor and it is caused by increase in temperature and action of wind right so evaporation occurs on surface of water bodies such as ocean lakes and rivers and on land surfaces such as soil and vegetation the amount of water that can be evaporated depends on several factors such as the temperature high temperature means uh, more evaporation wind speed high wind speed means more evaporation but also water availability so if there is uh, enough water that can be carried by the uh, the wind and uh, temperature at that time then there will be more evaporation and vice versa now precise calculation of evaporation is crucial for all water related projects and in particular the projects that um, use the water stores okay so water uh, storage projects such as reservoirs or irrigation systems or even water supply system for those projects evapor evaporation is critical okay so more, more evaporation means less water is available for the purpose of that project and uh, that's why we need to know the uh, technique to accurately estimate the evaporation. And there are different techniques available uh, to estimate the evaporation, which include some empirical methods uh, that relies on climatic variables. And there are some advanced physical models as well. Now, next parameter is the transpiration. So transpiration is the process by which plants absorb water from soil and release it into atmosphere through their leaves. Okay, so during transpiration, water is taken up by plant roots and transported through the plant to its leaves and it releases the water through small pores called stomata. Okay, so this process helps to regulate the, regulate the plant's uh, temperature by releasing excess water which can have a cooling effect, obviously. Okay, it's nearly like uh, the sweating of the animals, right? So, 
This is one of the reason plants are used to reduce R1 heat effect in the cities. Okay, so when the water is released from um, from the plants, because of the water, the um, temperature in that area will be reduced, and, and that's why to reduce the R1 heat effects in cities, plants are used. So the rate of transpiration is influenced by various factors, including temperature, humidity, wind speed, type of plant, and so on. So for civil engineering applications, uh, we combine the evaporation and transpiration because both process release, uh, takes the water from the surface and release it to the atmosphere. So uh, instead of um, calculating evaporation and transpiration separately, we combine it together and we call it evapotranspiration. Okay. Next is the infiltration. Infiltration is when water seeps into the ground during the precipitation or irrigation. So when water falls on this ground, then water seeps inside the ground and that is called infiltration. This process defines the amount of runoff from the area and the groundwater recharge. So when the water falls here, either it has to go inside the ground or it has to move on the surface and uh, that will define what is the amount of runoff and what is the amount of groundwater recharge. So what are the factors that affects the infiltration? Infiltration is controlled by the permeability of soil. Okay, How permeable is the soil? So that is one of the factors. Infiltration also depends on uh, soil texture, compaction of soil, slope of the soil. So when it is steep, there will be less infiltration, vegetation cover, and so on. So as we know, when soil is compacted, infiltration rate can be very low, uh, resulting in increased runoff and reduced groundwater recharge. Similarly, infiltration can uh, be limited in areas with steep slope, and that means uh, it may cause higher erosion and also um, sedimentation. Vegetation cover can significantly affect the infiltration rates. How? Um, because it improves uh, the soil porosity and it enhances the soil structure. That means it allows water to infiltrate. Okay. Now next is the runoff. Runoff refers to the flow of water over the land surface after precipitation. So this is the amount of water that does not infiltrate. Okay. So when the rainfall occurs, uh, some depending on the capacity of the soil, infiltration capacity of the soil, uh, some of the water will infiltrate inside the ground and the excess amount will travel uh, downward, okay, towards the downslope. So it, the water finds the downslope and then it travels towards the downslope. And eventually it flows through the, uh, through the river and then it goes either to lake or, um, or eventually to ocean. So the amount uh, and timing of runoff can be influenced by very fact, very, very, uh, very different, uh, various different factors such as intensity and duration of rainfall. If it is the duration of rainfall is long, then you may get a different kind of uh, runoff. If the duration of rainfall is short, you will see, you see the different kind of runoff. Uh, and also uh, for the different intensity of run, uh, rainfall, the runoff timing and runoff duration would be different. So we'll look at this in, uh, in a great de detail later so how we convert the rainfall into different uh, runoffs this also depends on vegetation and obviously topography and there are different hydrological models available to estimate the amount of rainfall that can be expressed uh, that can be expected uh, in a particular catchment or basin okay so uh, when there is rainfall how much water will come uh, out of that 
particular basin, we can calculate using different hydrological models. Now let's talk about importance of hydrological cycle or water cycle. Life on land is directly tied to water cycle. Without the hydrological cycle, there will be no water on earth surface and that means there will be no possibility of sustaining life on land. So life on land it has crucial dependence on the hydrological cycle. So obviously that is the most important point. But there are other factors as well, other benefits as well. The first one is the climate regulation. Okay. So we know heat transfer occurs in three different ways, conduction, convection, and radiation. Sun's radiation is the primary source of heat on Earth. Okay, so how the heat from, from Earth, sorry, heat from Sun transfer to Earth, that is the radiation process. Within the uh, Earth surface, convection is uh, the one that transfer heat from one location to another. So convection transfers heat through fluid movements. So fluid means air and water. Okay, movement of water and movement of air. Okay, so air and water both are called uh, fluid. In water cycle, convection is important for moving heat around. When um, the ground or water is heated through the radiation. The air or water above it becomes warmer. Okay, so when it is heated, it becomes warmer. When uh, water vapor or air is heated, uh, uh, that when it becomes uh, warmer, it becomes less dense. And when it becomes less dense, it rises up. Like, okay, so it is heated, uh, it becomes less dense, and it dries up and that means uh, there it creates a vacuum for uh, the dense air and water to come at that location so that generates the current and that current moves uh, moves the heat upward eventually carrying the heat to the upper atmosphere so this way hydrological cycle helps climate regulation by transferring heat from the land surface and ocean surface to the upper atmosphere. Second important uh, point is the fresh water uh, circulation. Okay, uh, fresh water circulation is obviously the key aspect of hydrology uh, for maintaining the life. And uh, this form of water movement. Uh, is essential for water availability at different locations as this is the only way uh, to supply water and distribute water worldwide right so that's the uh, the natural way of supplying and distributing water throughout the world now during the movement of water it is not only the water molecules uh, that move but also the chemicals and nutrients Okay, so um, when we talk about the movement of water, it's um, not only uh, the water molecules, but it also moves the chemical and nutrients at the same time. So this movement of chemical and nutrients is essential for the growth and survival of plants and animals and the distribution of water around the world helps to support the support this wide variety of ecosystem okay so uh, when water falls on top area of the catchment and then uh, through the runoff it uh, it is not only the water that moves down but also uh, sediment organic matter as well it moves down and that is available for uh, the plants uh, downstream right and when water infiltrates inside the ground, then um, various nutrients and chemicals are dissolved in water or um, insoluble uh, nutrients also is transported by water to downstream. So 
the movement of water and movement of chemicals both are important the another important aspect is the uh, disaster mitigation okay when water moves um, uh, it can lead to natural disasters okay depending on the quantity it can lead to floods it can lead, lead to droughts and it can lead to landslides okay if the quantity of water is very big uh, it can create floods and landslides um, so when the quantity is big uh, floods when the intensity is high landslides and when the quantity is small then it creates um, droughts so understanding the factors contributing to these disasters such as rainfall patterns and soil condition it is crisp, it is important uh, to develop effective disaster mitigation mitigation plans okay so um, studying water and its environmental movement uh, in hydrology is critical for developing such plans okay now the another one is the economic uh, uh, benefit so there are other uh, economic benefit also so hydrological cycle provides um, uh, water at the upstream of the catchment which can be used to generate hydropower right so hydropower is the rene renewable uh, energy source and it, it depends on the movement of water okay we need to have water um, in the stream to generate the electricity and hydrology hydrological cycle is the only source of water except in the pump hydros um, hydrological cycle is only source of water right similarly navigation is uh, another economic benefit so when the water is in the river then we can use that as the for the navigation purpose so these are um, some of the important aspects uh, important benefits of the hydrological cycle Now let's talk about the factors that influence the hydrological cycle. So what makes change in the hydrological cycle? Number one is the climate. Okay, climate is one of the major factors that influence the hydrological cycle. So uh, precipitation, evaporation, and transpiration, which are different parts of the hydrological cycle. They all are uh, influenced by climatic factors such as uh, temperature, humidity, wind, and atmospheric pressure. So change in climate can lead to change in these uh, different components of the hydrological cycle and eventually impacting availability of water, quality of water, and natural ecosystem. For example, change in temperature uh, can lead to uh, change in the uh, amount of precipitation right and that could lead to change in the uh, amount of runoff and uh, received by river okay and that affects not only the aquatic animals but also um, also uh, other animals that use that uh, river uh, water system Similarly, change in the amount of evapotranspiration can impact the water balance of ecosystem. Okay? And it can lead to change in vegetation, soil moisture, and groundwater recharge. Land use is another factor. Change in land use, such as um, urbanization, deforest deforestation, and agriculture, can change the infiltration, runoff, and evapotranspiration pattern and this change can lead to long-term water balance uh, change as well okay so if the infiltration runoff and evapotranspiration pattern is changed the water balance of water balance of that that particular system will also change for example um, when we do urbanization and convert the natural land into impervious surface like buildings and roads it will increase the surface runoff okay uh, there will be less 
uh, infiltration inside the ground because of impermeable uh, roofs and impermeable um, roads. And that means uh, there will be more runoff available at the time of rainfall, and that means increase in flooding. Similarly, deforestation can lead to a reduced interception of rainfall, which means increased surface runoff and a re reduction in groundwater recharge. And this leads to change in the hydrological regime of river and, um, and the streams. Agriculture practice is another factor. Okay, so uh, with the irrigation, because when we have agriculture, uh, there could be uh, irrigation, and irrigation can lead to increased water consumption from from river, and uh, more infiltration in, in the ground from that. Uh, when we drive, when we derive water from river, and irrigate the land, so um, there will be. Uh, more water consumption, so less water is available in river, and uh, it goes to the production of uh, crops. So that will have uh, also effect in uh, the hydrological cycle. Human activities uh, on water. So, for example, if we build dams or if we build um, uh, irrigation canals or if you draw water from groundwater um, then if you draw water from ground then it will also impact the hydrological cycle for example if you build a dam then uh, the runoff will be captured by the by the dam and then there will be less flow downstream of that particular dam so if you draw the uh, water from irrigation uh, for for the irrigation purpose so um, there will be less water in the river system. So that will also affect the hydrological cycle of that area. Okay, so um, uh, urbanization, deforestation, and uh, uh, and um, the ag agricultural activities all are also the human activities, but they are they impact in the form of land use so we change the land use pattern whereas direct activities on water are like um, building the dams building the reservoirs um, you know, drawing water from ground ir building irrigation canals and so on next aspect is the geology geology also affects the hydrological cycle uh, geology of different lab location would be different and uh, the types of rock, soil, and soft surface uh, structure of the catchment determines how water moves through the system. For example, if there is a permeable soil, um, then it allows for greater infiltration and groundwater recharge, whereas if, if the geology has more impermeable rocks and clay and shale, it can lead to increased surface runoff and decrease infiltration okay so uh, the structure and orientation of rock layers can also influence groundwater and flow patterns the uh, the presence of macrophores the uh, pipe life structures inside the soil that will also affect the uh, uh, groundwater flow and ultimately the hydrological cycle Uh, the last one is the uh, topography. Obviously, uh, topography or the shape and the elevation of land surface can affect the hydrological cycle by uh, influencing the water movement. For example, when it is the steep slope, then it can lead to rapid runoff. And when there is rapid runoff, when the velocity of water is high, it can lead to erosion uh, compared to the flat areas uh, where the velocity of water is less and the erosion will be um, less and when it is a flat area it the uh, the velocity of water is uh, slow and that means it promotes the infiltration and groundwater recharge now let's to uh, look at the Know, global water balance okay what is water balance 
Water balance refers to the balance between the amount of water entering and leaving a given system. So if you look Earth as a whole from space, there is no water entering and leaving the system, right? But within the Earth, there is movement of water and we can uh, see where the water is moving and how it is moving. Okay, and that defines us the global water balance. So um, the main compo the main important components of uh, the uh, hydrological cycle is evaporation and precipitation, right? So that's the biggest part. Evaporation over ocean is 436, and evaporation over the land surface, uh, evaporation and transpiration combined. Total terrestrial evapotranspiration on land surface is 65.5, right? And the amount of rainfall and or precipitations, precipitation over ocean is 391, and precipitation uh, on the land surface is 111. Okay. Now, if you compare the evaporation over ocean and precipitation, there is excess. Uh, evaporation, which means some of the uh, evaporation, evaporated water on ocean moves to the land surface and eventually supports uh, the pre precipitation on land. And that quantity is 45.5. So all the quantity here is in terms of 10 to the power 3 kilometer cube per year. Okay. Now, out of this um, uh, uh, total precipitation rainfall is 98.5 and snowfall is 12.5 on our surface. Now we can also see um, how much is the uh, evapotranspiration. So from forest, this area uh, 29, similarly from wetland 0 0.2, and from cropland 7.6, from grassland. Uh, 21 and so on. So this way we can calculate where this evapotranspiration is coming and uh, we can also divide where this rainfall is going, right? So 54 in this uh, forest area, uh, 2.4 in lake area and 11.6 um, in the cropland and 31 in grassland and so on. This uh, figure here with the rectangle shows the quantity uh, stored, the amount of water stored at one particular time. Okay, so this is just one snapshot at any one given time only. So these values may change. Uh, it's not constant. It, it can change at any time and it is constantly changing, but at one particular time, just give uh, one snapshot. Okay. So this is uh, water vapor over land is 3, water vapor over sea is 10, um, amount of water stored in uh, river is 2, okay, and similarly soil mixture is 17, lake is 175, and so on. Now let's talk about uh, the catchment water balance. So when we talk about the water balance, uh, global water balance, it was the water balance of uh, the whole earth. Um, now, when we talk about the catchment water balance, it is the water balance within the catchment only. So, water balance, as we mentioned before, uh, is uh, the study of what is the inflow and what is the outflow, right? And what is the amount of storage. So, if we want to write this in the form of an equation inflow minus outflow is the change in storage okay so inflow in the form of rain snow sleet uh, diversion from outside of the catchment uh, groundwater from outside so these all are the inflow in a particular catchment so let's talk about the catchment pause what is catchment Cat catchment which is also known as water shed or drainage basin, is a geographic area of the land that is defined by the natural boundaries of high points, such as rills, 
uh, sorry, rises and hills, and that separate is from neighboring areas. Okay, so what basically that means is all the water that falls within this um, uh, catchment, okay, all the water that falls within this catchment uh, eventually reaches this outlet. Okay, so this is Fitzroy River catchment. So water droplets that occurs um, that falls anywhere in this area eventually comes to that point okay so from from this point it is always downward and then uh, eventually it is to this point but if the water falls just outside it will have different uh, down slope right and then it will go to some another uh, catchment and so on So all the precipitation and surface water such as river and stream flow to uh, one particular point. So the lowest point in the catchment and leaves the catchment from that point. Uh, assuming there is no lakes, right? So uh, then it will be slightly different. But if there are no um, depressions like lakes in the catchment, then obviously everything will uh, flow to that the lowest point of the catchment uh, and then leaves the catchment now the size of catchment can uh, be different it can vary greatly from small ones small catchment of few hectares to uh, very large countries in sometimes uh, multiple cities or multiple countries as well okay so for example uh, if you if you are looking at this uh, uh, Isaac River. Okay, so this is the Isaac River here in the Fitzroy, right? So this is Isaac River. If you look at this catchment, then this area will be the catchment of the Isaac River. Okay, so this is the uh, catchment area of the Isaac River. But if you look at the small portion of the Isaac River, maybe upper, uh, very upper uh, area of the Isaac River, then only this area will be the catchment of the Isaac, and so on, right? And then if you look at the whole Fitzroy basin then at this point the entire the map shown here is the catchment of that feature river basin now so when we talk about the catchment water balance it is the balance of water within that particular area okay um, upper uh, isaac catchment lower isaac catchment uh, upper dawson catchment connet river catchment and so on so, okay so or maybe you can have very small uh, creek and it has its own catchment okay uh, catchment water balance refers to the study of the movement and distribution of water within this particular geographic area okay so uh, we can measure how much water uh, it enters this catchment so uh, in uh, that is the inflow of the water within that catchment uh, how the water flows in that catchment obviously number one is rain snow uh, sleet so whatever it falls from the atmosphere number two is um, the water that we divert from outside so if there is a big river here and then we need water in this area then we can uh, divert the water from outside the catchment and that is also now the inflow within the catchment and also if there is a groundwater flow so we don't we can't see from the from the surface but there may be water flowing uh, from the uh, ground uh, okay so the groundwater flow is also the inflow in the catchment next is the outflow outflow is the quantity of water leaving the system so outflow means the water flow so the river flow okay which is leaving the system uh, similarly it can have a uh, groundwater flow Okay, the water uh, leaving from Fitzroy catchment to the other surrounding uh, catchment through the ground. Okay, so that's the uh, outward groundwater flow. Uh, obviously, the evapotranspiration to the atmosphere, right? Uh, precipitation is the inflow, whereas the evapotranspiration is outflow. And also, uh, diversion. So, we might uh, decide to divert, uh, for example, water from Isaac Basin to uh, this area we need water in this area and then we we decide to divert some of the water from Isaac to that area that means the uh, diversion of water so that is also outflow 
and Catherine water balance is basically inflow minus outflow will be the change in the storage storage in the river system and storage in the catchment uh, sorry groundwater okay within that catchment so how much is the change in the river uh, system and how much uh, is there is there a change in the groundwater that defines the change in the storage so that's the basis of the catchment water balance inflow minus outflow is the change in the storage now um, we can define the uh, water balance in uh, different forms so even though it is the inflow minus outflow um, we can generalize this inflow minus outflow in different forms so uh, so the most general form of the water balance is uh, this one which represents the inflow inflow P is the precipitation, uh, QSI and QGI are the surface and ground water inflow into the boundary from outside. Okay, so this is the catchment area. So if there is a groundwater flow, right, from the uh, outside of the catchment, then that is QGI. And if you have the diversion from the outside, from other rivers, then QSI, that is the surface water uh, diversion or surface water inflow so that is the uh, inflow part p plus qsi plus qgi is the inflow part and the outflow part is the next one right so here e plus uh, so when these are brackets so it is, should be plus okay all these values e plus qso plus qgo these are the outflow okay so that's the outflow uh, from the system so it can be evapotranspiration again the groundwater flow outside of the catchment and also a diversion of water from let's say from this area you want to divert water for uh, to the another uh, catchment thank you and that will um, uh, the, gives us the total outflow minus the change in storage okay minus the change in storage minus the n n is the term called uh, discrepancy term okay so uh, we may not be able to exactly quantify all the inflows all the outflows and all the stories obviously um, because we need some uh, we use some kind of estimation uh, techniques but that will not give us uh, accurate results so there will always be some kind of discrepancy and to balance that uh, uh, to balance the equation we use uh, discrepancy term and so this is uh, the most common version of the water balance equation the most general version of the water balance equation for catchment now we can simplify this depending on uh, our application so if it is for the large river basins then we can just say precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus the uh, river flow is zero okay that's the equation p is the inflow minus e minus q equals to zero so what is the difference here we are not considering the storage because we we can assume that uh, storage um, is constant before and after for a very large basin there is not much uh, there would not be difference and also uh, if there is some groundwater inflow there will be some groundwater uh, outflow and the assumption is that that is also balanced okay so that means the simplified equation is in the form of precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus outflow from the in the form of dr equals to zero now the next one is the water balance for water bodies for example lake so um, how we uh, simplify that equation inflow minus outflow is the change in storage okay here the storage is important so when when you talk about the about a lake for example so what is the average inflow what is the average outflow from the lake will change will gives you the change in storage of water at that particular lake or reservoir okay so when we talk about uh, the water balance of water bodies then it is important that we include the storage 
whereas when you talk about the large river basins then uh, that is not very important now third example is water balance for a direct runoff that means when there is a rainfall immediately after a rainfall how the water moves okay so we have the we have a small catchment here okay so let's say we have a uh, small catchment here and then we want to have the water balance of uh, the uh, the catchment for a particular rainfall okay so rainfall is going to happen for let's say uh, three hours how that the water the precipitated uh, water or rainfall will move okay so uh, p is the precipitation obviously the amount of water uh, entering in that uh, system uh, in, in form of rainfall then there will be some interception so interception by trees and interception by a vegetation okay though that means before it reaches the ground it is intercepted and uh, eventually evaporate, evaporated okay so there will be some losses from the interception there will be obviously some evapotranspiration during the uh, the rain period or our study period there will be direct runoff from the uh, river so there will be river so uh, uh, the outflow from that river so you have the rainfall and it eventually reaches to the uh, catchment outlet okay so that is the uh, runoff and some amount of uh, water will be infiltrated and there will also be some depression storage so what does that mean when the rainfall occurs and the surface obviously is not uh, uniform right so there will be some small undulation and then within that undulations there will be storage of water so the water will be stored there for a while and then eventually it will be evaporated okay so it it doesn't go for the infiltration it is not evapotranspirated uh, immediately but it is stored there and eventually it will be evaporated and that's because of the um, roughness of the area okay so small undulation of the area which occurs everywhere and that is the depression storage okay so this is the water balance for a direct runoff so when you ha have the rainfall for let's say two minutes intense rainfall and you want to find out uh, what would be the uh, um, river discharge because you are interested in the flood um, if the intensity of rainfall is very high you want to know how much uh, water will be coming out of that river and if it is going to create some flood or not okay so in that situation uh, you want to do this water balance uh, of the direct runoff okay so there are different purposes obviously if you want to see um, use the water for um, uh, water supply or for irrigation and uh, from the reservoir or from lake you want to see the water balance of um, uh, of that um, water body right so you you don't want to draw too much water so you need to see how much um, what is the minimum uh, storage required for the ecosystem uh, of the that particular water body okay and that will decide how much water you can draw from that lake or from that reservoir now let's uh, talk about the question here um, one water balance study a very simple one in a catchment area precipitation was measured to be 500 millimeter in a year so in one year precipitation is 500 millimeter evapotranspiration is 400 millimeter what is the runoff uh, in the catchment area uh, that year if the groundwater storage is, in, is increased by 30 millimeter so precipitation is 500 millimeter in a catchment area evapotranspiration is 400 millimeter right so if a 400 millimeter loss to the atmosphere and 30 millimeter is stored in in the ground so what is the runoff so basically we just uh, uh, use the uh, the same water balance equation inflow minus outflow so uh, precipitation minus evapotranspiration should be equal to what is going out which is runoff minus change in storage right 
or you can write precipitation minus evapotranspiration minus runoff minus change in storage will be equal to zero okay so rearranging this so 500 minus 400 so precipitation minus evapotranspiration should be equal to runoff and the change in storage which is 30 and eventually the runoff is 70 millimeter so the the water that goes out from that catchment is 70 millimeter in that particular year now let's talk a little bit about the water scarcity and uh, water distribution around the world so this is the figure that shows the annual runoff so amount of runoff from the different uh, um, at, at the different area and you can see uh, these areas has uh, smaller uh, annual runoff from 0 to 10, 50, 100 and then the blue ones uh, gives us the higher runoff areas. Okay, so uh, Amazon and obviously uh, the, this area uh, has the highest uh, runoff and also these uh, North uh, European countries also have the highest uh, runoff. And uh, if you look at the uh, river discharge, now when we talk about the river discharge, then uh, how much water we draw and how much uh, evapotranspiration occurs in that area, that also defines. And basically, in general, uh, higher rainfall means, um, higher runoff means higher annual river, river discharge would also be uh, higher. But if we draw more water and use more water, and then that may change, make a difference okay so if you look at here uh, western uh, sorry uh, northern european countries they have the very high annual runoff but in terms of annual river discharge it is not the same as other um, countries like here right now uh, the third important aspect is the water scarcity index okay so it depends on uh, the human population as well so not only the availability of water but uh, how much water is available to the human population and human consumption in that area and that uh, shows the scarcity okay so we can see uh, us uh, especially western part of us uh, northern part of china uh, middle east uh, india all has the uh, different levels of high water scarcity okay now let's look at uh, the water budget of australia so the table here shows the average annual rainfall and runoff in millimeter uh, for different continents okay so africa 690 is the rainfall runoff is 260 and the percentage of runoff is 38 percent so out of um, the total rainfall 38 percent uh, goes as the runoff whereas um, in south america 57 percent converts to the runoff but in australia if you compare here this uh, rainfall obviously is low but uh, runoff is significantly low so that means most of the water is lost either in um, evapotranspiration or or recharge inside the ground right so uh, but um, this figure doesn't tell us if it is goes for evapotranspiration or infiltration but it just says most of the rainfall is lost and uh, uh, that lost in, in in terms of the evapotranspiration or the uh, groundwater infiltration and based on the uh, based on the climate of australia we can imagine there will be more uh, evapotranspiration so these figures obviously are the rough estimates and actual rainfall and runoff can vary uh, within each uh, continent depending on the local uh, local conditions so, so it's not like it's the same 12 percent everywhere in australia so uh, at different locations the values are different Now let's talk uh, about a little bit about the water budget of Australia. Okay, so um, 
there are five divisions uh, uh, that contributes 88% of the total runoff and it covers only 26% of the uh, continent area. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, and that covers 26% um, area, but it has 88% uh, of the uh, runoff. Now, it is important um, to know that the, uh, the distribution of surface water is not uniform, right? Uh, as everywhere, uh, we can imagine the uh, throughout the world, the distribution of water is not uh, uniform, obviously. And same happens here as well. The distribution of water is not uh, same throughout. Uh, bulk of the water is in tropical north, right? So tropical north and this uh, uh, Tasman area. Uh, which are generally um, outside the major population center, right? So um, uh, these, these, you can see this figure here. This shows the uh, major population. So where, where the population concentration is here, but uh, in the east side and uh, in the port area, but the actual water availability is at the north. Okay, so this area we have water, but population is here. Okay, so uh, this uh, puts the stress in water in this area. Okay, so because we need water here, because population is there, and that means we need to draw water from whatever available in this area for human consumption, for irrigation, and all those purposes, and that put pressure in the ecosystem of the rivers and water uh, available um, availability of that area. 